But in today's video, we are going to show how to create a GPT-powered chatbot in a Django blog, or really any website that you want. I'm going to really take things from creating the embeddings, which is kind of a fancy way of taking text and um, fine-tuning the model so that it it can learn all of the different uh, so in my case there's blog posts and it can read all the blog posts and kind of know about them so if we ask the chatbot questions about the blog post it can answer them and yeah the kind of final product is there's this little chat box thing you go in here i can ask it questions like I made a blog post where I sort of made up my own vocabulary. So there's this one term, uh, what is clean cocaine? And clean cocaine is protecting someone by exposing them, them to something less bad. So the idea is, um, you know, oh, I don't want my kid to have like cocaine that's cut with battery acid. So I'm going to give them like clean cocaine. Um, and yeah, I, I just have a blog post that um, comes up with a bunch of these terms. So here's another one that's called like gift boxing. And I could even ask a question like, uh, what does clean cocaine have to do with gift boxing? And then, yeah, clean cocaine requires gift boxing in order to make it look good. So this uh, chatbot can really answer a lot of questions about different things. Um, like here, I have a blog post. I, I haven't even, I have not um, scripted this. So I, I have a blog post about job interview tips and questions. Let's see if it can pick that up. Uh, what are some job interview tips for a geospatial professional. If it doesn't know how to answer it, it'll basically just say, I don't know, which it may say. Nice. So it says, general and tips include researching the company, dressing up a little more than usual for an in-person interview, um, making sure you have a wired connection, good lighting. Um, and this is not just it's normal answers. It's answering purely based off of my blog posts. Um, so if we go in here, I talk about researching the company. I talk about um, uh, making sure you have a wired connection, that you have good lighting. So all of these answers that it's giving is purely from um, my blog. And I could even say, uh, what is blogthedata.com all about? And yeah, it talks about it's a technical blog. It helps people to get into geospatial web development um, with tutorials and cloning repositories to learn. I'd say that's a, a pretty good summary. Um, and it's really exciting. I just, I think this is super cool. I already have this in production. If you go to blogthedata.com, you can see that um, all going. Um, so that's enough demoing. Why don't we just show you how this has all come together? Why don't we go back to the home page and um, here is the uh, code that I have here. And why don't we just blow this up and bump this up so everyone can read it. Um, here's my base template. And why don't I, let's see, we'll go to the 127. Do, do, do. Here we go. All righty. Here's my base template. This is what all other templates inherit. And by putting it into the base template, it means that this little um, chat option shows up on any page we go to. So if I go to a different uh, tab here, if I go to my portfolio page, I still have the chat bot on all the different pages. And where did I inject that? Um, boo -boo -doo, right, here, uh, that's the CSS. Here we go. Include blog parts chat box. So in the base template, I'm injecting this template. Let's check out that template. It's in my uh, blog folder, inside templates, inside parts, and it's called uh, chatbox.html. And here we are. So inside here, um, I did a little copy and paste. I, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. So 
there was this one YouTube video I watched. It's this one. It's uh, by Patrick Lober, and he talks about uh, adding a chatbot to your website. I pretty much borrowed all the front end stuff you can see on his chatbot. You know, it looks a lot like mine, so I'm I'm pretty much stole the CSS and HTML, but I've really added a lot to it and really built on top of this example. Um, I'm, you can see mine's blue, his is purple, but I, um, yeah, so check out his repo and watch his video on, um, on the way he did it. And I'm going to make it really about chat GPT is a big focus. And I think my implementation is a lot cleaner and better than his. So I'll leave that up to you to see who, who did a better job in creating a chatbot um, video. Okay, so get you can get all that from his. I, I'll provide a link for my code so that you can copy mine. And yeah, I, I don't really need to jump into all these different details, but um, this is the front end code for the chatbot. Uh, I am going to be using a combination of JavaScript and HTMX. So JavaScript is really good for example, when I'm here, I'm using JavaScript to push um, messages into the chat box. So here's another one. What is Clay? That was another blog post I had. So when I hit submit here, I'm using JavaScript to push this into the chat um, into the chat box. But then HTMX is actually um, sending the reply. And I'll, I'll explain a bit in how I kind of do that dance between using JavaScript and HTMX at the same time. Uh, so here's my chat box. Um, and why don't we first start with the JavaScript part? Because I think that'll be the most, um, like make the most sense because not a lot of people have experience with um, HTMX. So I'll start with JavaScript and then I'll go into what's happening with HTMX. All right, um, inside my chat box, um, again, a lot of this code is copied from that other video, but I've cleaned it up. I've, um, I think I've made it better. Uh, so there's first, we've set up three different selectors. One is that open button, and that's going to be this button right here. So if we do an inspect on this, um, we have this button right here. It's called chat box button. And that's why it's selecting chat box button. And then there's the actual chat box kind of window, and that's called chat box support. So if we open this up and we take a look at chat box support, you can see it's it's that that whole thing when it's opened. And then there's the send button, and send button is, as you might have guessed, the send button right here. So we have that class send button right there. Um, so we have this button. We have the chat window, and then we have the send button. Those are three m major um, like elements that we're working with. And let's see, where do we want to start? Um, so we first have this class chat box. It's initially set to false, meaning it's not opened. And there's a display function. Let's go down to the bottom. Yeah, so the first thing we do is you can kind of read this a little bit from bottom to top, but we first create this new chat box and that's going to contain all this um, information. And then we call the display function. So let's take a look at what that does. If we go into the chat box and we look at display, this is a uh, method of uh, the class chat box and it's going to add an, uh, a listener to that uh, open button. So we want to check to see if the user has clicked on the open button. And then we also want to check to see if the user has clicked on the send button. Uh, we also want to select the text area. And in this case, the text area is uh, this one right here. So text area is where we're typing in the prompt. Um, so, yep, we want to select that. And then right here, we are 
adding an event listener called input. So it's listening to when we type into the text area. Um, node is now assigned to that text area. And as we type, it, what, what this basically does is it, it's adjusting the scroll height as we type. So if I do something like um, hello world, like that, and then, you know, I'm typing, I keep typing. You notice how there is the, it's, it's getting larger and larger. If you didn't do that, the, um, this text area would just get a scroll bar and it wouldn't get any bigger. But by doing this, we are making sure that the scroll height is expanding with the input. And, th and that's what that does. And now we have this um, key up check. So what we're doing here is if we have um, hit the, oh yeah. So this is saying, what, what, what is this saying? To key up shift key. If key equals enter and does not equal shift key. Okay, perfect. So we are saying if you hit enter, we go in here and I hit like, you know, hello world, and I hit enter, that's going to submit. Um, that's going to submit. But what I don't want, and this is a pattern I like to do, is if I say like, hello, and then I hold shift and hit enter, I want it to go to the next line, as opposed to submitting the um, submitting the request. So I can do world, and then I can hit shift, enter, and now I go to a new line. Um, so this code here is basically saying, if they've hit enter, and they haven't held down the shift key, then send the message. But if they have hit enter, and they are doing the shift key, then don't do this. Um, so kind of ignore enter if, they've ho if they're holding shift. Okay, and then, yeah, this toggle state is being run. Let's see where it's being run right here. So if you click on the open button, we are running the toggle state function. So it's going to just flip the state. Um, so if we go in here and we're clicking this, this is saying, um, you notice how there's an, a class being added to this um, div, this div that holds the chat box. So if I click here, it's removing the class. And if I click again, it's adding the class. So uh, that's where that this dot state is being, um, is being done. And let's see if I, yeah, show or hides the box. If the state is true, then add active. If the state is false, um, remove the active class. And let's actually take a look at the CSS for that. I'm, I'll probably do a, a deep dive into the CSS at some point, but I'll just browse the CSS for now. Uh, where did I put it? Should be in static files, CSS, main.css. So go active. Yeah, so if the chat box is active, we are going to have a display of flex and it's doing some other things. If it is not active, if it does not have that class, then it's going to have a display of none, so it's hidden and then it, it, won't, it won't show the, um, the chat box. Okay. Uh, so we know how that works. That toggle state is either adding or removing that class, which will hide or show the chat box like that. And now on send button, um, let's actually talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about the send button first. So as we talked about up here, we've, we've got this listener on the send button. And let's take a look at here, send on send. Yep. When we click on the send button, it's going to fire this function called on send button. Um, and likewise, if we hit enter, we're all hit enter without the shift key, we're also doing the send function. So there's two different ways to submit a request. I can either 
type in here um, uh, like what is clay and hit enter and it can send it or I could hover my mouse over send and hit send and it will also submit. So there's two different ways to submit a request. Um, and the send function, it will query that text area and that will get the text field. And why don't we just throw some, throw a console.log on here, console.log and the text field value.trim. Oh, we can actually just, why don't we just console log text one, um, just to kind of prove that this is working. And we'll take a look at the console, clear that, open this up and click, um, uh, what, I wonder if it can do this. Like I've wrote a blog post about this. What are John Solly's core values? I wrote a post about like a family constitution. Yeah. And yep. Says I patience, kindness, thankfulness, all my core values. And you see it, it logged this to the console. So when we grab this text field, we are querying the text area. And the text area is, as I mentioned before, where the question is. So it's picking up whatever question you have currently in the in the chat box. So if I've written something here and I hit send, it's going to grab whatever is in the chat box. It does trim. I believe that just removes like new lines and spaces so that the, the AI isn't confused by that. And then, yeah, if I happen to hit send and there's nothing in the text box, I just do nothing. Yeah, it's just gonna um, ignore it. And there's looks like there's a bug here where I'm still querying the API, but nothing's gonna get submitted. Um, at least nothing's gonna be added to the chat box. And then once we send, we run this update chat text function, and this will um, this will be what pushes the prompt into the uh, chat box support area, and that's chat messages. So is it chat messages? Oh yeah, so we're in chat box header, chat box support. Um, oh yeah, I know why it's that, because it, it keeps scrolling up. So chat messages is are where all the messages are. All uh, right, so it's gonna send, it's gonna call this update chat box, and it's going to pass in that chat box that we have, and then the text that we've picked up from the text area. And yeah, it's going to find that chat messages. This is where um, all the text is. So you see chat messages is where we're gonna be submitting. And then it's gonna grab the message. Let's see, content creative. Oh yeah, that's each of these ones in here becomes a new div. Um, so here, this is a div, that's a div, each message becomes its own div. And then we're going to add either a class, we're going to add this class name. So um, in this case, this update chat text function is only submitting messages based on the user. So I have kind of some custom CSS that is styled just for the user. And that's messages item or messages item user. If we go into this... Um, uh, messages item user, it has, it, it's going to put the message on the left side. I think it does some other stuff. Um, mm, yeah, it's going to be blue with a white background. And that is uh, right, um, uh, right here. So when I submit from here, it's applying the CSS to this. And if we check this out, you notice how this has messages item user, and then this has messages item bot. So messages that are coming from the user are getting certain classes, and the messages coming from the bot are, are getting different classes. All right. Um, and the message content is going to be the text, and we're going to um, prepend and that's going to add the div 
like this div that we've just created into the uh, chat messages area. And finally, the last thing we want to do is make sure that the text area has no input in it. Um, so if we, um, once we um, hit a message, like what is clay, and then I hit send, my expectation as a user is that this text area gets wiped out. And that's what this will do right here, is it'll wipe out the text area to make sure that there's no message in there once you hit send. And that's pretty much it. So this chatbox.js is purely being used to push messages from the user into the uh, chat messages area. And the reason why I wanted to use JavaScript for this is that when you use HTMX, it's mainly um, a good tool. It's, a, it's sending server-side HTML to the client. And that, that requires a round trip to the server. And it makes sense if you are submitting um, data coming from like a chat bot, but the messages coming from the user, there's no reason that the user's question needs to have like the div created and submitted to the chat box um, by the server. We can do all that client side and that's gonna be way more performant. Um, if you don't do that and we hit like, um, you know, like what is blog the data? com and hit send it would take like a second maybe for the message to even get pushed into the uh, into the chat messages area because we're doing a round trip to the server but with javascript it's going to just go in there right away uh, all right now i want to now talk about now that we're done talking about this uh, javascript which is all about the user we can now talk about uh, HTMX, which is everything to do with the chatbot. And um, yep, so this text area, that's exactly where um, the question is being asked right here. This is text area. And um, we have this placeholder, write a message, right? Write a message. And then we're doing a very similar key up key, uh, like just like we did in JavaScript, um, we want to make sure our HX trigger is that it hits the enter key and that we have not hit the shift key. Uh, why don't we actually check out the HTMX um, documentation. Let's look at like HX trigger, um, triggering requests. <coughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, I think there is a something called a filter. Filter trigger filters. Okay, so with trigger filters, is you can pretty much do anything that is a JavaScript expression, which is really cool. So if you put anything inside brackets, it can be a JavaScript. It just um, like a um, any valid JavaScript will work within the brackets. And that's what I've done over here is this is valid JavaScript right here. And when this evaluates to true, the trigger will fire. So if we have this key up, it, it has a key up event and this condition is true, the um, HTML request will be, the HTTP request will be sent. And we're going to send a post request. So if you use HX post, that's sending a post request. If you do HX get, that's a get request, HX put, um, so on and so forth. And we're going to hit this endpoint, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then this HX include is saying, what are we going to send to the endpoint uh, with our request? And in this case, it's everything that's in the text area, because that's going to be our prompt that we're going to send to chat GPT. And uh, likewise, um, this HX target is going to be the chat box messages, HX swap after begin. Let's actually um, take a look at some of these. So we'll take a look at HX include first. Um, HX include. Um, all right, HX include. So HX include. They talk about it. Here we go. 
allows you to include an additional element values in an AJAX request. The value of this attribute is a CSS query selector. Um, so you can also do like valid JavaScript in here. In my case, the AJAX include is grabbing the ID question text area. Do we go back over here and we inspect this? This is, um, oh, no, this area right here where the you notice that the um, ID is um, question text area right there. That's the ID. All right, and then Ajax target is where we're going to be sending the new HTML and Ajax swap after begin. Why don't we check that doc? Ajax, Ajax swap. Swapping. After begin is prepends the content before the first child inside the target. Now I played around with this. It might be a little unintuitive. I would I thought it was going to be after end, where it should be after the target. But just the way it works, um, <laughs> it's a little bit of a mind bender. But after begin, we'll make sure that the message we send, or when we push a new div in, that it's going to show up after. Um, the message. So if I type in um, like what is blogthedata.com, the after begin is going to push in front of this one. So it's going to go below it. And that's what after begin, when it pushes it in, it's going to go here. I think if you did um, after end, it would actually go up here. Um, and that's actually, we can totally try that out. So HX swap is after begin. What were the other options? After begin, before begin. Before the target, before the first child, after the last child. Let's try before end. Before end, so we're doing after begin, and we'll try before end. And now let's try that same message. Um, what is blogthedata.com? Oh, hmm, interesting. That still worked. Let's try another one. Um, test. Wow, that also worked. I honestly have no idea how that actually worked. Before end. Did it actually save it? Let's try it again. A test. Oh, yeah, okay. I just hadn't, uh, it hadn't picked up the changes. So you notice it went above it, which doesn't really make sense to me. Um, you would expect you send a message and then their message is below it. Um, but in that case, because I did um, before end, it put it before the, um, the message. So we want to flip that back to after begin. And then let's reload the server and let's do another test. It should go below it. Yeah, there we go. So you want to make sure you do after begin. And then let's see. Yeah, we can actually um, put a breakpoint here. I think it should be able to hit it. And let's see. So we hit a breakpoint and we do um, what is blogthedata.com. No, I didn't hit the breakpoint. But I can put the breakpoint in the view. So we have this view called answer question with GPT. Um, I want to put a breakpoint here. And just to kind of show the way HTMX works is just like you have a, a URL, a view, um, that it's using that same URL view paradigm. If we go to URLs, we've got a answer. We've imported this view. And I've associated that view with this uh, path. So if anyone visits um, answer with GPT, it's going to send the request to this view. And that's going to be right here. This is the answer with GPT that responds to that path. And here you can see when it sends the HX post. Is it a post or a get? Um, HX post. It will send it to that view. So let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, I'll ask it, it just I'll ask the question again what is blogthedata.com now we're right in our um, 
right in the in the right view. And if we go into the request, we can start um, taking a look at some of the what we got here. Um, well, the first thing we want to look into is um, I get the the actual question that was asked by going into the post object and getting this question text area. So if we go into the post object, we've got a bunch of properties here. Uh, what do I get into? Post get question text area, probably down here. Let's see, post question text area. Yeah, what is blogthedata.com? Um, and the reason why it has this property inside the post is because when we went into the post right here, um, no, not post chat box. Yeah, here we go. It's because we did this HX include. Um, and this HX include is saying, hey, bundle the whatever's in the question text area into the post object. And, and once it's in the post object, we can interrogate it and, and grab it. Um, so we'll go here. Actually, I don't need to do that. I can just go to the next, go down one line, and now we have um, question is now initialized to the prompt. I set up a little logger just to um, like log the question to the database. I'm kind of curious on, I have this in production, and I'm just curious like what questions people ask, so I have that uh, written to a database. Um, I do have a tutorial on logging that you can check out um, and to learn more about what's going on here. Okay, now um, let's see. So this completion is calling this function called answer question. Uh, so let's go in here and let's go to answer question, which is another function I have. I believe it's in here. Or did I import it? Oh, I, I have it in utils. Okay. So it's going to call this answer question. And inside, um, I have this little utils function here that is going to answer, this can answer questions. So this is plugged into the chat uh, OpenAI API. And let's dive into it. Um, OK, um, where are we going? OK, yeah, answer question. So now we're inside this, um, this function. I'm going to go over some of this stuff in the future, so just kind of ignore this for a moment. Um, it's going to go through some stuff. It's going to go through some embeddings. But the main idea, this, let's go into, uh, let's add a, add a breakpoint at some point right here. I'll add a breakpoint. I think it might have already skipped past this. Um, nope, I got it. Okay, so now if we go to here, we'll hit play again. Okay, so the response is choices zero text. So if we go into choices, no in response. Oh, here we go. So wh what we're doing here is I've used the OpenAI completion where it's going to have this prompt here where it basically says like, answer the question based on the context below. And if the question can't be answered, say, I don't know, context. And then there's this context variable. And then here we've actually added in the question. So we're asking, this is the question, give me the answer. And the question is, what is blogthedata.com? So after this function runs, I'm just using the default properties here. You can mess with, with these ones are kind of changing the way the completion is going to work. But um, after you send the request, the response is going to come back with an answer. And the answer, if you go into choices, ch -ch -ch -ch, response, um, choices, typically there may be one or more responses that OpenAI is going to send, but we, the choice is zero is always the most preferred answer, like the one that it thinks is the most accurate. And we're going to grab the text of that uh, choice. So choice zero. Um, wow, I just exposed my API key, so I'll have to <laughs> blur that out of the video. Um, so yeah, we've got this choice zero, and the text is at blogthedata.com. Okay, I'm wondering if I need to 
yeah, there's my API key again. I might just need to block all this out. I might just kill this. <laughs> or I'll, have to change, I'll probably change my API key for the video. That'll probably be the easiest answer, so no one hacks me. Okay, um, so we got this response. There's the completion. Okay, so this is now extremely similar to what we did in JavaScript, where the response is going to have those CSS classes, but instead of the question being with these CSS classes, it's going to be the completion, and the completion is uh, what the answer is. So if we go back to this chat box, no, 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 the um, chatbox.js, you see we were adding this class name to um, the message using item user, and we were adding the, the message, which is the question. But in our case, in views, we are adding these CSS classes using the bot CSS and then adding the completion. And then kind of the magic of HTMX is we're now actually sending an HTML fragment back to the client. And that if we, let's take a look at what response is. So if we just type like response, you notice this is just straight up HTML, like it's a whole div. And then we go here. Now, oh, I've got some fancy stuff going on there. Yeah, so it sent it. And we can even see in the browser that it got a 200 from answer with chat GPT. And it sent the message right here. And let's close that right here. Yeah. And similarly, if the user hits the send button, like we click on it, it's going to do a very similar action where it's going to also send a post request to the same exact URL. It's going to include the same exact area. Um, so essentially, we're, we're telling HTMX, do the exact same thing if they hit enter when they hit when they click on the send button uh, just like we did in javascript um, so that is pretty much how the chatbot works uh, let's go back here um, so i've kind of explained you know you type a message in here if you hit send javascript is handling pushing the question into the chat messages area and then htmx is grabbing the question and then appending um, the answer into the messages area. So now we'll want to talk about like how is this completion done, how is the model being trained, um, and we'll go into all of that. So um, the way I figured out most of this, we'll just clear all that out, is we go here and we go to the OpenAI. Um, I followed this blog post. I'll put this in the description and it's pretty good. It just goes through. You're like setting up a web crawler and you're pulling data from different websites. And so, you, you know, you use pandas, you do all this web scraping, and then you're going to tokenize everything that you get back. And then once you tokenize it, um, what are you going to do? Do some fancy stuff. Then you create embeddings based off of your tokenized um uh, what we tokenized, and then we turn it into this like NumPy array that will have um, these vectors, and then you create context based on the vectors, and then you create this like answer question function, and there you go. You've got this like Q and A bot system. So my example, I've pretty much borrowed a lot of the code from these examples, but I've really ta tailored it toward a Django blog and how my blog's set up. And so if you have a blog that's similar to the way mine's set up, you can pretty much follow my process exactly and uh, get my same result. Um, so let's go through it. So the first step they talk about is we don't need to set up a web crawler, but we do need to export our blog posts. Uh, so let's start with that. Um, so where I put all this is inside, I think I put this in utilities. Yeah, this is inside my, um, my repo if you want to check it out. Under create embeddings, um, I first need to export posts 
and then we process the posts and then we uh, I, I believe we tokenize them and then we do some other stuff so starting with exporting the posts is um, yeah this is gonna be a long video guys okay so this is just getting my environment set up that's all like kind of boilerplate stuff um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to connect to my I have my blog is in a Postgres database so I need to connect to it and I'm using environment variables for the username and password and now what we want to do is query I have this table post that contains blog posts and we're going to select all the different fields so there's title slug category ID meta description all the different fields and that comes directly from Let's go to Django Project blog models. Um, so every post has a whole bunch of different fields. And these are all the, uh, the posts in my, all the fields for my post model. So we're querying all those from the table. And then we're going to export each post as a separate JSON file. Um, we can actually uh, Put this here and I can actually run this file and we can just see what it's doing so far. Um, so we go here, run and debug. Um, I have the server running. I should be able to run this in addition to the server. So let's go to current file. Perfect. So um, with connection right here, posts equal fetch all. So let's take a look at posts. So you can see it's it's fetched all the different posts that I have, and each post has um, these like zero through ten or zero through nine correspond to all these different um, attributes. Um, so zero is going to be the title. This is going to be the slug. Um, that's going to be the category ID, so on and so forth. Um, and then what it's going to do is basically go through each post and um, you can actually reference these fields based on the um, the title. So why don't we go to um, right here and I'll hit play. So now each post, let's go to check out what a post looks like. That's going to be that whole post and we can interrogate and we can get the post title and that's the post title. So it's creating this dictionary that contains all the different fields. I had to do some fancy stuff with the category because if you notice here, the category is actually a um, just an ID and the actual category name is stored in the category model. So I needed to do a um, like category objects dot get um, to get the category name. And if we go to models, you can see this category is is using just a foreign key between the category table and the category. It doesn't actually store the category name in the post table, but inside category, we have the name right here. Um, so by referencing the category by ID, we can grab the name and that's what that does. And very similarly with the user, um, the user ID is, um, or the author, is just an ID of two, but to actually get the author's name, which is my name, is we have to query the user object to get that. Um, so if you have any kind of foreign primary keys in your Django tables, you'll wanna do some of this fancy stuff to actually get the, the text of it. Because if the, um, the AI isn't really gonna understand what um, a category of 12 is, well, it might be able to figure it out, but it would be a little bit easier if we told the AI, hey, this is category dev tools, this is category productivity, as opposed to just giving it a number. Um, so I'm I'm naming all the files based on the post slug. So if we go into exported posts, all these different posts here are being the file name is based off of the post slug, and and that's pretty convenient because the slug isn't allowed to have spaces, is not allowed to have special characters. Um, the spaces are replaced with dashes. So I'm guaranteed that these are going to be valid file names using the post slug. Um, so it's going to just dump all the posts and then close the database connection. So I'm going to close this just so I don't overwrite my files. Um, so we'll cancel this one and my server is still up. Uh, yeah, so once you, if you click on one of these, 
it's going to have the title, the slug, and it's just going to actually have the whole blog post and everything is just on one line. Here's the author, the date posted. Um, so that's great. And the author is not just the number two, it's a real string. All right, so once you have your um, posts exported, let's look at what the next step is. Um, so this exported um, is pretty much taking the place of their web scraper um, because we're not scraping any web, we're not scraping the internet, we're using our own blog posts. Um, so we did all that. Um, so now they want to do the tokenization is the next step after saving the raw text to a CSV file. And the other thing is, <coughs> in their examples, they're using CSV, but I just really don't like using CSVs because they're comma delimited. If there are commas in your title, it will just F everything up. But if you use JSON, JSON is not going to be confused by commas. So I always recommend using JSON. Don't use CSV. I, I hate CSV. Use JSON instead. Um, okay, so now we're going to tokenize, and they have this whole tokenization step. Um, so a tokenization is basically they um, kind of chunk all the text into um, four characters at a time. Um, so they say like 100 tokens is approximately 75 words, and this will just be the AI needs everything tokenized in, in order for it to understand it. So why don't we go into, what do I do in process posts? Um, what am I doing here? Creating embeddings, exported posts. OK, we're reading the JSON data. Interesting. OK, I'm doing some further processing here, where it wants to remove new lines and spaces. So after I've exported all the posts, I run this script. And this script is basically going to go through all the exported posts. It's going to grab out all the ones that end with JSON, which is all of them. And then it's going to load them. We're going to append the post fields to the list of posts. Um, so title, category, date posted. Append the post fields to the list of posts. Okay, interesting. I guess this is just kind of following their example. We are creating a new um, post post uh, list, and it's going to create a, a pandas data frame, and it's kind of re-ingesting the title, category, date posted, author, content. This is everything coming from the posts, and then it's going to do this like removing the new lines and then saving. Um, into a new directory. Um, I guess I could have included this in the export post step, but I really wanted to kind of export the post, keep them in their raw format, and then this process post is a way of, of cleaning up, removing all the new lines. So I'm guessing when we train the model, it it just is like jamming all the text together, not using new lines. So we end up with is this exported post that has all these blog posts, and then this processed, um, which slams all of the blog posts into a single JSON file. So if we go in here, um, it's just, you know, all the new lines are removed, everything is just slammed together. And uh, that'll be useful in the next step. Instead of having to read a whole bunch of different files, this export, or this, uh, what is this script? Um, not this one, the process posts is what jams them all together into a single file, removes all the new lines, jams them all together into a single JSON file. And in their example, they end up saving it to a single CSV file, which I think is a terrible idea. So do it to a JSON. OK, so we exported our post from the database. We process the post by removing all the new lines. And then what's the next step? Oh, it was the tokenization. So now we need to tokenize posts and create embeddings. Um, let's see, I have a simple one in here, uh, which I thought was interesting. Is it actually going to load, reading, create a data frame? Oh, yeah, it's not saving any file, so I can just run this one. Uh, let's actually run it and see what it gives us. 
um, go to run and run current file. Right, so here's this little um, little plot that it developed. And what's interesting here is what this is saying is this is a histogram with um, these are the, um, let me check their blog post to see what they say this is. So they, it, it's a very similar graph, right, that I got from theirs. Um, so on the x-axis is, yep, I believe the x-axis is the number of tokens. And then the y-axis is um, number of posts or number of documents. So the newest embedding model can handle up to 8,000 tokens. Uh, so most of the rows would not need any chunking, but this may not be the case for every subpage. Okay, so what this is saying here is that um, OpenAI can handle anything that is 8,000 um, tokens or less. So we can see that I have around 100 blog posts, so about 90 of my blog posts are in that range. But I do have a couple blog posts that are really big. So one of my blog posts is, I think, of like a resources one that looks like it's around 40,000 tokens. And I have another blog post that's around 25,000 tokens. And then there's one that's right around 10,000. So these blog posts will need to be split up. Uh, they'll need to kind of be tokenized and split up because the AI can't handle more than 8,000 tokens at one time. And that's what they talk about here. They say um, we need to split anything that is over 8,000 tokens. Um, most of the rows would not need chunking, but this may not be the case for every subpage. Um, so that this code will split the longer lines into smaller chunks. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be splitting them. And I pretty much copied and pasted this, but I did make some adjustments since they're using CSVs and we're using JSONs. So why don't we kill that? And I'll show you my actual tokenized post and create embeddings. Um, so we're using this uh, tokenizer. We're going to open up that uh, process post. So this is the JSON file with all the different blog posts in it. Um, we're creating a data frame. We are tokenizing every line so this will add the number of tokens to each one so why don't we does this end up writing a file i believe it does but we'll stop it before it gets to the end so why don't we hit a breakpoint right um, here and we'll hit play on this one. Oh, it's already running current file oh interesting i'm gonna Kill this one, and we'll run this one. OK. So what we've done so far is we've loaded that process post. We've created a pandas data frame with all of the post information, um, where I believe every row will be a different blog post. Um, and let's just check that out. So we have this data frame, data frame, and what's data frame 0? Oh, I think we need to do, we need to take a look at head. Yeah, um, so here's all the different blog posts. You can see all these blog posts. Well, this one has around 8,000 tokens. Um, I wonder, I'm going to see sort by in tokens. <laughs> we do head dot sort sorted. And I'm going to use some uh, chat GPT right now. I'm just, I'm not a very good pandas guy. So let's see. Um, how do I show the top 10 rows of a pandas data frame based on a descending in tokens column? Okay, sort values, top 10 equals DF sort values and token ascending false head 10. Oh, that looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, so now we're looking at the top 10. You can see this 
collection of timeless phrases and sayings, that's around 39,000 tokens. This next one is 26,000 tokens. So these are the ones that are going to need to be split up. It looks like we're only going to need to split like f uh, one, two, three, four blog posts, but it is important that if you do have longer documents, they're going to need to be split up. All right, um, split into mini. Oh, interesting. The max tokens is set to 500. Okay, that just must be a, this is like a boilerplate code that I copied. Um, so if we go into here, I think they have a max token. Yeah, they use max tokens 500. So even though the it can handle up to 8,000, it's just splitting it into 500. Maybe that just works the best. So it's gonna split it. Um, all this code is really a copy paste. I don't really know what's going on here. I just sort of like blindly copied this and just hope that it knew what it was doing. Um, and it keeps going through. I pretty much copy pasted. I did change some code to make it work with the um, pandas data frame for a JSON file. And yeah, honestly, copy and paste my code. It ends up working what it ends up outputting. We're going to kill this. And let's go to process. So now it creates this embeddings.json. And these embeddings, you notice it has these vectors in here. And um, OK, so I'm not a uh, AI developer, but it's, as I understand, it's the cosine distance, or it might be the sine distance. And it's a way of, um, man, I'm going to totally botch this. Let's see if it talks about what this is. Um, yep, it creates um, the embeddings. Uh, what are these vectors? Vector numbers, which was the conversion of raw tech into cosine distance. Um, so these vectors are likely related and might be able to answer the question if they are close in cosine distance. So the way the AI seems to be working is based on your question, the text is going to be a certain cosine distance. So it's going to look through all my blog posts. And then based on the question that's asked, it's going to find the blog posts that most resemble the question. Um, and all these cosine distances are stored in the embeddings file. Uh, all right. So I've kind of combined. They did this tokenization and embeddings. I, I combined the tokenization and embedding step into one script because it kind of made more sense logically to me. So after you tokenize and create the embeddings, it's going to create this embeddings.json file. And then let's see what our next step is. So we created our embeddings. So it's embeddings.json because we like JSON, not CSV. And then now is when we start to work with, um, let's see, uh, bum, 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 flatten, da, da, da. Yep, so we're, we did all that eval stuff. OK, so now um, there's this create context function, and then there's a answer question function. And this was really copied from, from what they're doing. Um, so I'll jump into that. Mm -hmm. OK, let's go back into our view. So we've created the embeddings. Um, oh, I do have one other. Uh, well, I'll show, I'll show this first. I hope you guys are following along so far. Uh, views, no, wrong, wrong views, right up here. Okay, answer question, oh, it's in utils. Okay, so this is how the answer question function first requires getting the context. And that's, it passes the question in and it pa passes in this data frame and a length and a size. I don't know too much about how this context works, but I, I know it's needed for the question to be answered. So this create context, it finds like the most similar context from the data frame, and then it's going to give that context back to the model. Um, and the way it works is it takes a data frame, and it's looking at these vector distances, and it's um, doing some fancy stuff. It's going through and, and checking the number of tokens, um, and then eventually it returns the context. And once you um, answer the question, you pass that context. Let's see, where does the context get passed in? Context equals create context. Yep, so the context gets passed into the, um, the prompt. So the prompt is going to have context, and it's going to have a uh, 
question. And let's actually take a look at what that context is. I'm forgetting exactly what that looks like. So let's go back to here and we'll say like, uh, what is blogthedata.com? What is blogthedata.com? Okay, we've got this question here. Why don't we just play along? Okay, context is, oh, you know what I think it is? Context ends up being all of the blog posts and all of the content it thinks is relevant to the question. So if we just uh, type context, you notice it's just like a huge amount of um, text. And this is all of the blog posts it thinks are relevant to the question. So when ChatGPT is forming a response, it's saying, oh, what context do I want to use to answer this question? And it gets that context. Um, based on these vector distances, it's like, hey, I think blog post five is important. I think blog post seven is important. I'm going to add those all to the context so that ChatGPT knows what it can pull from. Um, okay, so I wish I could explain this a bit better. I'm honestly doing tons of copy-paste from their um from their example. So you'll have to just trust me that it works. And then um, the last bit I wanted to talk about is um, right here. We have, it says currently the data frame is being passed in each time to answer a question. For more production workflows, a vector database solution should be used instead of storing the embeddings in a CSV file. Um, <laughs> my baby wants to play. Um, good thing mommy's home. Okay. Um, the data frame is being passed in each time to answer a question. Um, okay. So if you probably guessed, I haven't done a vector database yet. I've actually done a super hacky thing that honestly works for me. Um, there's not a million people hitting my website. So it works for me. If you want to do a vector, vector database, you will get better performance if there's a billion people hitting your site. Uh, for now, um, I didn't do that. Uh, so I'll show you how I did the kind of prototype version of what it needs to do is I created this file down here, save vectors to pickle. Uh, and this is something I came up with is uh, Python has this um, thing called a pickle, and it's a um, binary format that is faster to load. So if you save something to a .pickle file, you can load it much faster than a JSON file or a CSV because it's all binary already. Um, so it's going to be slightly faster than JSON or CSV. Um, and what I basically do is I first, you know, we grab this embeddings JSON. Um, I'm going to create a new pickle file. And um, we're loading the embeddings, so we're loading everything from embeddings.json, we're creating that data frame, that pandas data frame, uh, we're uh, applying, what are we doing here, convert embeddings column from string to numpy array, yep, that was in um, one of the steps that they had in the tutorial, and we're basically dumping the data frame into a pickle file. So when I am running the script, Right at the top here, you notice there's this load pickle file, and then I set a global data frame to load pickle. Um, so what's happening here is that um, we are opening this data frame and storing it as a global variable. And I believe once we start our Django server, it's going to bring this into memory and keep it in memory. So it's actually going to be pretty fast as long as you're data frame isn't just super, super massive that it takes up all your RAM or memory to hold it. I mean, for a small use case, I have 100 blog posts. Keeping a small data frame in memory is not going to be a huge memory footprint for me. And this uh, variable will stick around as long as the server is still running. Um, and the only performance hit we're getting is that it will load it on startup. Um, but again, once you start up your Django server and it's in memory, we can query it pretty quickly. I haven't benchmarked of like how much slower this is than using a vector database, but as, as you could tell in my examples, when I'm on blogthedata.com and I'm submitting um, like questions like uh, what is blogthedata.com, what is clean cocaine, 
the main latency hit I'm getting is actually um, OpenAI processing the question and, and creating the answer. I'm not really seeing a huge performance hit from actually getting the vectors from the data frame. So if you copy me, pickle your data frame, and then say I save it as a .pickle file just within my uh, project directory, and then I load this global data frame um, in my utils file so that it accesses the global data frame uh, right here. And if we go into their example, we can see where are they using their data frame? Answer question, data frame. Here we go. Um, yeah, this is exactly what I did here. Um, turning the embeddings into a NumPy array is the first step, which will provide more flexibility in how to use it. Um, so we created this data frame right here. And then this is where it creates that um, Let's see, do, do, do return joins. Yep, we broke it up. Do, do, do. We did the answer question. See, it's getting this data frame being passed in. And yeah, you can answer questions with the data frame. And what they're basically saying is the data frame needs to be passed in each time to answer a question. And that could be slightly slower. But again, I have a slightly faster solution where we're pickling the data frame and then loading it in. Um, and that uh, pickled data frame will stay in memory, so there's not going to be a huge performance hit there. Again, um, if you have a, real, a lot of traffic, you might want to um, explore um, how this works. So they have some interesting examples of different vector databases you can use. So um, yeah, that is basically it. Just as a summary, let's see, this is good. Oh yeah, we were doing the completion, so let's just play that through. So when you have your Django blog, what you're going to want to do is first export the posts and then run this process posts so that you slam them all into one JSON and remove all the new lines, and then run my tokenize posts and create embeddings. That will um, tokenize the posts, split them into max 500 uh, tokens at a time, and then um, write all that to an embeddings JSON. And then um, this save vectors to pickle is going to take your embeddings, load them into a data frame, and then save that data frame to a pickle file. Um, so, you know, you've exported your posts, you've processed them, you created the embeddings, you've um, loaded them into a data frame, you pickled them, and uh, You've saved the pickle somewhere in your project, and then that's where you start building the bot and making sure the bot works. Um, and yeah, now we have a functioning bot. Let's take a look at the. Um, we were looking at Django project, oh, blog templates, and parts, chat box. Yep. And now we've got this kind of chat box. It can open and it can close. Just like this, it opens and closes. We can submit messages. When messages are submitted, they are sent to this answer with uh, GPT function. That function is a view uh, right here. And then it uh, gets the question. It uses this answer question function, which will respond um, based on using that global data frame, it will answer the question based on the content that it's been given based on all those embeddings. And then we're uh, getting a response, which is the answer to the question and submitting that response back. Once the response comes back, we're using HTMX to push it into the chat messages window. And uh, yeah, there you go. Um, I hope this has been useful. Um, I didn't really type this up like, you know, we're starting from scratch. I, I basically, the way I, I do my tutorials is I just uh, read through code. Um, so I hope you're able to follow along. And yeah, if you have any questions or if you need any help getting this working in your blog site, I'd love to help you out. So just let me know.